Whereas when you're in Manhattan, there's a whole, uh, almost like an assault to one's senses. So much noise and so many people and so much stuff. We're going to go totally to the opposite end of the spectrum. We're going to go to the desert. So normally when you think of desert, uh, you think of um, the word deserted or empty or quiet. But yet in Hebrew, it's a very different word. In Hebrew, the word is midbar, the word for desert, which uh, comes from the word to speak. And if you think about it, the seminal event of the Jewish people happened in the desert, which of course is the Aseret brought what's known in English as the Ten Commandments, even though of course there was a lot more than 10 of them. That's a whole different lecture. So basically you have, uh, we were spoken to in the desert. And the question is like, why? Why did the children of Israel not get the uh, Torah given to them in Egypt so they could prepare or when they got to Israel? Why was it necessary to wander for three months in the desert before they got the Ten Commandments? And there are many different theories and uh, ideas. And the one that I like the most, again, if we weren't speaking with hundreds of people on Zoom, I would ask all you guys your theories. But then you'd have like two Jews and three opinions. We'd be here all day just answering one question. So against my better judgment as an educator, I'm more into the monologue than dialogue mode. But we are happy, though, to get your questions in the chat. So basically, um, the thing I like the best is you needed the three months in the desert so they could connect with themselves. The desert does speak to you. In Hebrew, the word midbar, the root is dalet betresh, which is to speak. And when you're on the desert and away from all the noise of civilization, I say speaking to you from New York the second, um, that um, you actually get connected with yourself. Sometimes you have to disconnect to connect. Uh, a few years ago, I climbed Kilimanjaro and I was explaining to my kids that uh, for a week, I'm not going to have any drinking water or food. We have to take it all with us. So they're listening and whatever. They weren't really concerned. And I said, by the way, I'm also going to be have no Wi-Fi for a week. They're like, no Wi-Fi for a week? How are you going to survive? Like, never mind, no water, no food. Uh, and it was glorious. For those um, that week in Tanzania, I could connect to myself, to the people I was with, to the stars, to the nature. And sometimes when you get away from it all, it actually helps you realize exactly who you are and what you are. And that, of course, is what happened many times in the desert. We find prophets such as Elijah going out to the desert um, to, to, to the expressions he was in, to clean out his head and to focus. We find King David going to the desert before he was the king. And also in the, the New Testament as well, we have uh, JC, otherwise known as... Uh, Yehoshua ben uh, Yosef uh, also going out to the desert as well to connect with his cousin, Yohanan the mikveh keeper, otherwise known as John the Baptist. So basically, a desert's always a place where we go uh, for the peace and the quiet. And there are people on this uh, talk who have been many times to Israel. And when you go to Israel, really, you go to the same old places all the time. You go to Jerusalem, you go to Tel Aviv. If you're going to go to the desert, you're probably going to go to Masada, which was is Israel's most popular site. And basically, uh, the desert, um, just to go and hang out in the desert, is not usually on people's itineraries. What we're going to do today is we're going to have a double sort of itinerary. We're watching a 25-minute presentation that I made with my friend Shmuel, who's also a tour guide. Um, I'm the one who speaks the Queen's English, and he speaks with a colonial South African accent. Uh, you'll spot him. He's a blonde one. The two of us went out to the desert and we decided to make use of the Corona times and go to places we don't normally go to. Because normally when you're a tour guide, like the, the group wants a certain itinerary, they want to go, quote unquote, where everyone else goes. So they wanted to go, they, most groups want to go to the Jewish quarter, to Jerusalem, to Sfat, to all the standard places. But now we had this very quiet time in Israel. We could go and explore off the beaten track and share what we find with you. Mm. So one more thing about the desert. For me, just personally, everyone's got their own favorite place in Israel. Whenever I uh, have a group, a uh, birthright group, or any other group that's more than a few days, I always ask them at the end, what was your favorite place in Israel? And of course, different people affects people differently. Some people love the hustle and bustle of, of Tel Aviv. It's like Miami Beach with Hebrew signs. They feel comfortable there. Some people like the spirituality of Jerusalem. For some people, it's too overwhelming. Some people like the green tranquility of the Golan and all the springs and the beautiful hikes. And some people like myself, like the tranquility of the desert, the peace and the quiet. Quite often when I have city or urban uh, groups and I give them a, a few hours to walk in the desert in silence and do stargazing, it stuns them. So they've never heard what Simon and Garfunkel referred to 
as the sound of silence, like the, the vastness of it. And of course, going back to the children of Israel, it makes you feel small and humble. It's by human nature, by, by nature is, we are the center of the world and the universe revolves around us. But when you go into the desert, you feel small and you feel humble and you feel that you're a cog in a vast eternal machine. And it teaches one the lesson of humility. So when asked why the children of Israel went to the desert for three months, A, to teach humility, B, to learn that, that, to work together, and C, of course, to learn that not everything comes from me, 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 I, I, I. When you're out in the desert, you need water and food to survive. And they were given the miraculous manna and water from various sources. And they realized maybe there's a force bigger than them, bigger than us in this universe. So that's a spiritual aspect of the desert. But from a practical aspect, what we're going to see today also it's a very, has a lot of strategic importance. The where we're going to go to today, and you'll see in the middle of the film when I whip out my map, we're going to a place that many people don't go to, even though, in fact, I doubt, I'd be very impressed if anyone has been there. Um, before there was Herod, of course, our good friend Herod, who we've spoken about before, there was the Maccabees, the ones from the Hanukkah story. And once they kicked out the uh, Seleucid or the Hellenized uh, Greeks who were there at the time, they themselves for 100 years had their own dynasty uh, of, of a Jews actually ruling the land of Israel in the Second Temple period. So historically, we're talking about from about 164 BCE all the way through to 63 BCE when Pompeii and the Romans came roaming in. And during that century, what the Maccabees did, and we're going to explore one today virtually, uh, even though I went and did all the groundwork for you, is we're going to see that they built a whole series of desert fortresses. And they built them for two reasons. One is because strategically they were important, because they were on the border with the Parthian Empire, which is today known as the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And they were building these fortresses along the desert, along the border, because the, it's to stop invasion. And B, they were good getaway fortresses. In case there was trouble in Jerusalem, this is only about a 40 minute ride today by car, or maybe um, a couple of hours by speedy horse back then to get to these fortresses. So because they were royalty, <coughs> they had certain things that royalty needed, such as bathhouses, uh, mosaic floors, water systems, etc etc so they served a twofold purpose both strategic and also um as getaway places and later on when the romans came in they appointed their puppet king your good friend of mine herod and he basically got these fortresses and upgraded them the most famous we talked about a few weeks ago as uh, the masada itself originally built by the hasmoneans but later upgraded by herod so there's many two you might have heard of a Herodian and Masada. There are also many others dotted along the Judean desert, such as we'll be visiting today, Hukania uh, and Pathos and also an Alexandrium. So basically the six on the, what's today the Israel side and one on the other side, the Jordanian side called Macareus. So without further ado, we're gonna plunge into the desert. The first quarter of an hour of the film, you have my friend Shmuel and myself, both was licensed tour guides. We're seeing one thing right now, and that's tourists. Um, and we're basically running through the desert, absorbing the atmosphere of the desert, the Judean desert, which is a shadow desert. It's not the Negev desert, which is below the Be'er Sheva desert line. And <coughs> seeing uh, the, the various flora and fauna there, but also as we get closer to this fortress, we start picking up on man-made signs, such as water systems, water reservoirs, all the things you, that you needed to, to have to survive in the desert 2000 years ago. In the middle, we're going to pause and um, take any questions. And then we're going to carry on to the actual exploration of this desert fortress itself. Again, it's called Hulkanya. It was built by the uh, Maccabees around the first century BCE, upgraded by Herod uh, in the first century, uh, just toward just before the year dot and basically uh, abandoned for the last 2,000 years. It's actually an archaeological wonderland that's never actually been fully excavated, as we're about to see. So first of all, to paraphrase Billy Joel, he talked about the New York state of mind, where I am right now, which is very noisy and loud. We're going to go now into the desert state of mind, and we're going to see why the desert is so special, spiritually, and also strategically and historically, what we can find in the Judean deserts in Israel. 
So without further ado, let's ask Dima to start the presentation. And again, if you have any disconnection or connection issues, um, you can find it on the YouTube as well. So let's start. Sound. It's not that he had a persecution complex, he just thought that everybody a whole string of fortresses in the dead. Shmuel Chantel, the running tour guide, together with Dr. Book. You find yourselves with us in the middle of the wilderness. And we're carrying on with the theme of Herod. Yeah, let's go. Herod, it's not that he had a persecution complex. He just thought that everybody was out to get him. He built a whole string of fortresses in the desert. Two are very famous, Herodian and Masada. The others less so. Today, we are trying to find some of the lesser known Herodian fortresses. Where are we headed? Welcome to the desert zone. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking for Hokanya. Hokanya. Or can we? We'll soon find out. Okay, and we're on our way in search of Hokanya. Somewhere here, amongst these hills, we have to find it. There's quite a lot of rolling hills and lots of humps along the route, but. Uh, you know you're in Israel when oh, How's the scene? <laughs> oh, they've definitely got the hump. <laughs> Let's see if this one's faster than us. Let's go. Yo. Yeah. They're pretty quick. Sounds like indigestion. Whoa. Whoa! That's what you call camel dust. What a scene! This is like a camel crossing migration in the desert. Wow! Welcome to the Holy Land. Okay, we're getting somewhere. We're now dropping into Nachal Schacha. And this Nachal, a stream, which is a dry stream, is mentioned in the book of Joshua, connecting us with the location where we are. And today it's dry, but if you come back here in the winter months, from about October through to February, there can be flash floods pouring down these hills, coming from Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, going down towards the East Sea, the Dead Sea, and uh, gorgeous terrain. Oh, whoa! Check out this! Wow. I wonder what these could be. Any ideas, Dr. Book? Well, I don't bore you, but these are borot, borot mayim. These are water holes. One of the big things in the desert, if you're going to live here, is how do you survive without water? And as my earnest colleague said, we have flash floods here. Three days of flash flooding filled up 40,000 cubic liters on Masada, 14 cisterns. And we're about to look for Herod Mini Fortress. This is already a sign that there's human habitation close by. So these two massive water holes are designed for capturing the water in the flash floods. You'll notice it's right off the stream itself. The torrent of water will come in. If you're going to waste, there'll be a small dam diverting the water into these systems. There's definitely signs of 2,000-year-old hydraulic engineering here. Fascinating, Dr. Book. And would you agree with me 
that this was most probably covered over, and over time it has collapsed. So in other words, the minute I step into this cavity, oh, above me would be the roof of the cistern. Absolutely, and that's the giveaway over there. Yeah, have a look here. You can see parts of the walls still remaining, uh, which, which, which of course was plastered. Here's the ancient plaster. Without this, limestone, which is porous, would just drink the water. So you need the plaster. But wow, antiquity is just everywhere. Let's have a closer look here. It's lovely and cool as you enter. Clear remains of human activity dating back to the period of Hyrcanus, hence the name Hyrcania. What year would we be talking? So the Maccabees were the Maccabees ruled from 163 BCE to 63 BC when the Roman uh, general Pompey took over the uh, empire, and then the Roman Empire was from 63 BCE all the way until its collapse after it became the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century. So these systems will probably date somewhere between the 1st century BCE and the 1st century CE. Somewhere in that 200 year period, about 2,000 years ago, these systems were built in the desert. Check you on the hill. Okay. We're ascending. Check how steep this is. <laughs> Fabulous. We'll see you in a bit. Hi. Yes. It's uh, particularly hard to put this into words, but uh, seeing so many different types of paths converging here, if you look on the other side of the valley, you can see there's a man's path <coughs> down into and then if you look at these paths behind me, you can see ancient shepherd's paths. Thank you very much. Look across this landscape. It's actually really changed. I'll have a breakfast. 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 I'll have a breakfast.
Shimon and Garfunkel. Let us enjoy the sound of silence. <coughs> appreciating the silence just want to point out modern water capture systems in the desert if you look down here in the middle of the valley that probably is a JNF catchment dam where they catch all of the runoff water that comes from the mountains of Judea oh and look behind me I haven't seen that yet you can actually see the outskirts of Jerusalem um, see the villages on the hill that's probably right next to Abu Dis uh, ancient Bethany where Lazarus was risen from the dead and close to that you'll have the mountains of the Mount Olives but uh, talking about the water catchment systems you saw the cisterns from 2,000 years ago here we have modern cisterns capturing this water and using it for agriculture but uh, I think it's time for a drink do you have any water on you? Fine. let's drink some of this ice cold Location, location, location. It's the last conical hill on the edge. Oh, it's a fox, a red desert fox. Yeah, you're right. See it running down? Uh -huh. There it goes. Wow. Amazing. What fox? Thank you. Anyway, so that hill you can see is strategically located on the edge of this ridge, which overlooks a wide plateau. And then there's a secondary ridge where there's the sharp drop going down towards the Dead Sea. And I'm not sure if you guys can see on the horizon, you can make out the mountains of Moab, which is today in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And those hills are higher than we, where we are. But uh, location, right? right? Location, location, location. And back in Herod's let's not forget, those mountains of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which were part of the British Mandate of Palestine, uh, were once where the Roman Empire entered. That was where the border of the Parthian Empire and the Roman Empire was. The Roman enemy to the east. This location we're about to enter is also a strategic border fortress protecting the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Well, makes sense to me. The land comes alive, reading the historical text. Check this out. No drone required, but here we have drone like footage. No, it's a caravan. Get the smoke out of here. <laughs> Check how this landscape changes. All these colored rocks, magnificent geological formations. The color of these stones the reds, the blacks, the yellows, the pinks. And we've reached it. Wow. What is this? 2,000 years ago, this is the main of a water system, hydraulic system that brought water into the field over there. Look how well it's preserved. Yeah. Untouched, unexcavated dam walls. This could have been housing the water. Damned if you do. Damned if you don't. Damned if we know. Ooh, well, you hear the story about the three wells? No. Well, well, well. It's incredible. Let's feel the history here. Look how the path winds up here. This is like the serpentine path at Masada. 
Check it out. Come, Mr. Book. Up we go. Sorry, Dr. Book. <laughs> Forgive me, I've sinned. <laughs> it's clear as daylight. And boy, is it daylight. It's now about 34 degrees. But if you look behind me, now I'm convinced it's uh, unquestionably some sort of a water cavity. Um, looks like it's divided into sections into different pools where the aqueduct would catch the water, force them into these cavities, and lo and behold, we had ice cold water in part of the water. Wow, oh. excavated virgin territory. And excavated glory. I just walked up here and found remains already of a Roman period roofing tile on some terrace from mosaic floor. Go and see what you puzzle to think. As you dive in to where we are on the land, so pointing in this direction, we are finding ourselves midway between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. Um, somewhere along this valley, you can see the road going via Jericho down towards the northern part of the Dead Sea. We find ourselves somewhere here in between. And to plug you into the time period, here we have the timeline. Hold that up for a second. And we are going to be dealing with a period from the Hellenistic period, Hasmonean period, Roman period. So we're talking about a what, do you ever do a stretch of the history? More or less. More or less. But probably focusing more on the Hasmonean and Roman period and Herod comes into the picture right here 37 to 4 BCE that was the end of his life in this physical world but let's plug into where we are what can we see here Tovia and what do we know about the site why is it an unexcavated site I mean I really see the potential of the space it's, it's just remarkable what still can be achieved in terms of studying and understanding the site well, there's so much archaeological sites in Israel that there's simply not the budget to excavate everywhere. It's incredibly difficult to get to, as we see by our run here. Uh, and then really, that's uh, the same remoteness is what preserved the site as well, from grave robbers, from antiquities, thieves. So almost 2,000 years since it was destroyed in a massive earthquake in the 7th century, more or less in situ. Even if you look down to our feet over here, you see these mosaic floors in a terrace laid 2,000 years ago. Mm. What's the giveaway that it's a bit of a luxury palace is in addition to the white tiles, you also have red tiles. Here are some black tiles. Where are the red tiles? There's a coloured mosaic pattern. Yeah. Of course, the big question is for my hill. Tuvia, back to you. We will have a little break now, as you have. Thank you. Okay, now we finally arrived to the fortress. We went through that very epic desert landscape. I was reading some of the uh, serious comments, and some people mentioned that they've never seen this part of Israel before. Yet, yeah, believe it or not, I'm literally... 20 minutes from Mount Scopus. That's how close it is to Jerusalem. If you drive down the desert road towards the Dead Sea uh, from Jerusalem, there's a turning to the right way before you get the Dead Sea where it says uh, Nebi Musa, which is the Arabic word for Navi Moshe, like Moshe the prophet. And you just make a right turn from the Dead Sea road, drive in for 10 minutes and you get to where those camels were. That's how close it is to Jerusalem. And it's amazing. I've never yet, actually, in all my 20, 30 years of tour guiding, I've only ever been with one group to where I am right now with you on uh, this video. So <coughs> it's just a question of knowing the right people who can take you to these places and having a convenient 4x4 vehicle to take you there. But it's just Israel is a teeny country, as you probably know, it's the size of Wales, right? Um, uh, or where I grew up in South Africa, it's the size of the Kruger National Park. It's teeny, and yet it contains such diversity that even people have been multiple times to Israel and think, been there, seen there, done it, bought the t-shirt. Uh, they haven't, because it, uh, it, it's just out, 
it's just mind-numbing how much there still is left to see. Um, Shmuel and myself are both seasoned tour guides. I've been doing for three decades, and I'm constantly finding new places. Who would have thought that literally 25 minutes away from Jerusalem, you have this untouched, serene desert fortress with the mosaic tiles still on the floor the way they were laid two millennia ago. It's just a mind numbing also how they managed to survive to see the ancient systems to see on the one hand the in inhospitality of the desert but on the other hand the beauty of the desert that attracted them there so someone mentioned they've been to nebu musa there's most definitely not a monastery there there's actually a muslim holy shrine it used to be a very important holy shrine for the muslims who believed that moshe was actually buried there even though the jewish bible does deliberately does not give a place of burial um, or a site so he won't become uh, uh, made an icon out of. But there is a there is a Muslim shrine there. Uh, but you keep on driving past the Muslim shrine, and literally ten minutes later, you'll see this path that we ran on all the way up to the fortress. Um, it's uh, if anyone knows anything about the Israel paths, uh, they all have different colours. The nature trails, but there's one particular nature trail that has three colours orange white and blue and that is the uh, israel path that goes from elat all the way up to the golan heights and part of it snakes through the judean desert now someone i could see afterwards asked me um where's the desert so the definition of desert is anything below two inches to to, to use your language of water a year or five centimeters of water a year which in israel is from Be'er Sheva below what we call the negev desert Negev is the classical word for south. And yet this desert, the Judean desert, as you probably know, is above Beersheba. What makes it to a desert is what's known as a shadow desert. It's not unique to Israel. They also have them in the uh, United States and other countries as well in Asia, where basically the water coming up to the Mediterranean, if there's a sea level, comes up to the hills of Jerusalem, uh, the clouds, they evaporate. It rains a lot in Jerusalem. And then they float over the valley between Jerusalem and Jordan which, as we know, is the lowest place on the planet Earth, where the Dead Sea is 400 meters below sea level. So the Judean hills break the clouds and they float over and create what we call a shadow desert. So that's where the desert itself is. The timeline, someone asked me. Well, there's two ways to get the timeline. I got this one years ago from the Tower of David Museum. Um, but also next month, I have a new book coming out called Jewish Journeys uh, to be published by Corin. Uh, that has a timeline in as well. It's about Jewish history, specifically this period, the Second Temple period of the Maccabees and the Persians and the Romans. And that'll be coming out next month with its own timeline in. Um, okay, what else? Any other questions? I'm just looking at the chat over here. If you have any questions, now is the time to pop it into the chat section. And before we finish off by going through the actual fortress itself and seeing what we can find in the fortress. You have to buy a book to get the timeline. I don't know if you do. That's one way to do it. Otherwise, you could just look up J Jerusalem timeline. That's what Google's all about. But you will notice that uh, we're the camels wild. Um, they're what's called semi-wild. In other words, they're like free-range chickens. They wander around wildly, but they are owned by Bedouin tribes who keep a loose eye on them. Uh, but they do wander around uh, that part of the desert pretty freely, but they're not wild camels. Uh, they're actually quite valuable for the Bedouins. Bedouins, by the way, even for people who don't like my comedy, are never angry. Does anyone know why? Because they're nomads. Get it? Nomad. Anyway, so um, have the walls and floors been refurbished? No. They have literally been lying there since the massive earthquake of the seventh century. And uh, just no one goes up there to steal the stuff. Quite often there's a problem uh, in Israel where things are taken for secondary or tertiary use. But because this fortress is so isolated, that is the mosaic floors, the way they were laid 2,000 years ago. It's not a tourist site. In other words, there's no entrance booth, there's no toilets, there's no infrastructure. And what you see is what you get, and which we're about to explore now in the fortress itself. As we wander through it, basically preserved or frozen in time, uh, what's left the way that it was built 2,000 years ago. So, without further ado, let is, so is this, one more question, so is this to the southwest of Qumran? It is to the northeast of Qumran. 
In other words, if you went back to the main road, you'd have to drive all the way down to the Dead Sea and then make a right to get to Qumran. It's so close to Jerusalem, it's even closer than Qumran is to Jerusalem. So it's the northeast of Qumran where we are right now. Again, the site is called Hukanya. Right, any more questions? All right, okay. And the reason I tell dad jokes is because I'm a dad. All right, let's go back to explore the fortress itself. We'll take some more questions at the end. Dima. Tuvia, shall, shall we uh, carry on with the movie or? I'm Sheikh. Yeah, okay, thank you. You can keep on writing questions. We'll, I'll, we'll address them at the end. We're now going to explore this Hasmonean fortress Let's see what we can find. Let's go and have a look. What do you need when you build a fortress? You need the four Ds. You need it to be a place that you can drive to, a place you can defend, a place where you can get food, a place where you can get drink. Dining, drink, defense, driving. Let's look over there. System number one, brother and sister. <laughs> brother and sister. With a hydraulic plaster. Over here, we have what is probably a bathing pool. The stairs going down to it, covered over by these blocks. And let's see what's down here, folks. Inside the system is a column base and a column drum. Now this is how Herod built in the desert. We have the same features on Masada and in Herodia, where Josephus mentioned there were long marble columns, but the reality was they were optical illusions. They were built drums, one on top of the other. And once they were completed and stacked on top of each other, they were covered with plaster made to look like one long column. In the corner, where the corners met, two columns were carved one next to the other, so the cross section looked like a heart. And there's one right over here. This is a corner column from 2,000 years ago from the Herodian Palace on top, which would have ended in a heart shape over here. Just lying here in the middle of the desert. Absolutely magnificent. My vision is to get this as a base of a table, a beautiful glass top, and this underneath, coffee table, lovely cup of coffee. Actually, at this stage, I'd like an ice cup cold. Cup of ice beer. Oh, ice cold beer coming up. L'chaim. L'chaim. Never remove anything from an antiquity site. Perish the thought. Who would ever do that? And what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, they did build aqueducts, as we saw. They built roads. And also, look at this. Technology. This arch has stood the test of time for 2,000 years. Aren't you glad I told you that? <laughs> and inside is a fourth massive water system. Huge! This water system alone could hold thousands of cubic liters. And the arch has stood intact the test of time. 2,000 years with hydraulic plaster still attached to the wall. They certainly don't make them like this anymore. Hello, Herod! He didn't answer back. That's because he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll finish off with a view. Have a look at this. Yeah, we're in the Holy Land. Look at this hole. Woo! Stunning. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hope you enjoyed that little exploring on top of 
Hircania, Hircanus. Let's talk a little bit about Herod. Let's finish off with uh, getting a little feel of who he was as a man. And what was he doing with all these desert fortresses that we're going to be exploring with you. We've done Masada off the beaten track. We've now touched on Hircania. Next up, Kipros, Sartaba, Herodian. Plenty more to come, but a little bit about Herod. Herod was a walking contradiction. On the one hand, he was one of the greatest engineers of the Roman world. On the other hand, he was crazy with the capital C, local, mad, <laughs> loony, but an incredible builder. And uh, this is just one of many fortresses he built all the way along the eastern border of the Roman Empire. With Parthia, he built a whole line of defensive fortresses, the most famous being Vesadra. And all, with the exception of one, on the western shore of the uh, Dead Sea. The one he built on the eastern shore was called Machoreus, which is in today's Jordan. And he, nothing was impossible to him. No, it can't be done, was not in his language. That's and that sure. is why we have this fortress here with no natural water except the flash flood. And yet he found a way through incredible engineering to provide it with year-round water as he did all his desert fortresses and we saw some of those systems up there but rumor has it you know with all its beauty here and the water and the life it became a place of death right right because herod was a megalomaniac he was also a maniac and he thought that everybody was out to get him so what he did is he replaced a very popular Hasmoneans, who were Jewish kings, and even though it also been slightly tyrannical, people's memory got a bit hazy, and people looked back on the good old days. And Herod, in order to cement his popularity with the people, married a Hasmonean princess. But then he was concerned about the family, so he invited them all to his wedding. And now people might understand in the modern day that everybody, the only person he let alive, was his wife Miriam's brother, the very Jewish name of Aristobulus, and we made him the high priest. And he was such a good looking guy that people saw him and said, wow, it's a shame we don't have any Hasmoneans ruling us anymore. That evening, he invited his brother-in-law to a swim in the palace pool, very near here in Jericho. And even though he was a very good swimmer, he died in a mysterious drowning accident as two of his bodyguards pulled him under the water. Oh, and that was boy. the course of his life. He murdered those nearest and dearest to him. He had two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. Ah, oh, yes. And for their 18th birthday present, after the most expensive education money could buy, they both got the same present death by strangulation. Rumor has it. Hircania was the place that he got rid of Herod Antipater. Right. The his last son. remaining son, Herod Antipater, he thought he was going to get the kingdom. He thought a bit too soon about. Thinking of him as old man, and Herod, who was on his deathbed, was his son's death as well. And that's the place of his life. Finally, Herod's beloved wife, Miriam, she wasn't his BFF after he strangled her children and his children as well. Yes, he in love. He was in love. He just couldn't believe what he done. He decided to make a word. Deserve the body in honey. Think of his helmet for him. And he carried on doing the deed. And got himself into his very skin. That is why to this day, Americans call their wives. He is a sick puppy and an incredible engineer. All the way back to the Well, it's getting a little hot out. I don't know if you can hear it. Whoops! The vultures are circling and the ravens are circling. I think they see us. They might. They fall off stick. My touch there. What's there? Hey. So uh, I heard some people that there was issues with the sound quality, which again, it's not really uh, thought of. But you will be happy to hear that we uh, pre-recorded this. As I mentioned in the chat, if anyone's following it. You can go onto YouTube to a channel called The Running Tour Guide, my friend Shmuel's channel. 
um, and you can uh, see the film on your own computers with much better sound quality. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is called Hulk Canyon, the Desert Fortress and some of the other films. Uh, you can also go to my uh, YouTube site of your book and you can see a short version of the same film as well. So basically, I'm um, looking at the uh, questions we've got. Some people ask questions about how these places were built. And uh, if any of you have seen the Mel Brooks film, It's Good to Be the King, uh, they were built with lots of slaves. Uh, and the material was all very local. And as uh, people ask about dry construction, it was dry, of course, because the desert, but everything's got cement and everything is uh, put into place. This is Roman technology with keystones and uh, whatnot. And the only places in Israel you find dry construction, that is massive stones without any cement or mortar, are monumental buildings, such as the Western Wall has no cement, the Cave of Machpel in Hebron, and another huge fortress built by the Maccabees in the Jordan Valley called uh, Alexandrium. Also, the stones are so big that the weight supports themselves. But when you use lots of small stones, like the ones you saw in this fortress, they are all put together with bricks and mortar. All right, any other questions? Uh, you can ask through your uh, chat session here. So basically, uh, just to uh, go again with the chronological period, the fortress we saw was built by the Maccabees uh, and re-fortified by Herod, then basically abandoned for many centuries. There was a small Byzantine monastery established in the uh, fourth or fifth century, uh, but then deserted by the Byzantines and destroyed in an earthquake. Um, someone in the seventh century, someone asked how this compares to the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were around at this period as well. Herod's mother actually was a Nabataean princess, um, and they were uh, on the other side of the Jordan. So their cities, there's a few of them in Israel as well. Uh, one of them is called Shifta, one of them is called Ovdat, they're the two. Uh, one's called Mamshit, they're the three Nabataean cities in Israel. Their main uh, necropolis or city of the dead is the famous Petra, that was carved into red land. Um, uh, red sandstone, but they had also cities from Petra going all the way to the port in Gaza on the Mediterranean so they could get the spices across the desert. But it is more or less the uh, same time uh, as this time as well. The, Hasmone the Nabataeans were around until the Romans forcibly converted them uh, around the first or second century of the Common Era. Tovia, it looks like you've frozen. Tuvia, are you still with us? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like Tuvia disconnected or something like this. Uh, let's wait. Once.
I'm really sorry for the technical issue. Uh, just uh, would like to share some general information about our lectures. Uh, to whom of you who is joining us first time, uh, if you missed us previous lecture for some reason, you didn't know about it and just missed them, you can watch all of our lectures on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash WZOUK. All our lectures are there. Usually we uh, uploading the videos. Uh, you, sorry? Can't hear you. Oh, now, is it better now? Sorry about this. Yeah, is it, is it okay? The rest of us can hear you, I think. Ah, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much, yes. Um, again, um, all our lectures you can find on our YouTube channel and all our, our events you can find on our YouTube channel and the Facebook page as well, facebook.com uh, slash WZOUK, where you're welcome to watch them anytime. Uh, to whom of you who don't have a Facebook, you, you can do it as well without any problem. Uh, I see Tuvia is not coming back to us for some reason, probably some technical issues. Let's give him five more minutes if you wish to stay. Bye -bye. If you have any other questions which I can answer, you're welcome to put them on chat or ask them in person. Uh, next month, we will um, host Tuvia as well with another journey. Unfortunately, under the circumstances, Israel is still close to the tourist. We, uh, but uh, this is the option what we have to enjoy the tours online. Let's hope it will be open on 1st of August. Um, yes, Tuvia is not working at the moment. Sorry? Chat is not working. Chat is not working at the moment. Chat, why? It looks like, yes, it looks like it works. Fascinating. It's frozen. You, it's frozen. You, uh, YouTube URL, yes, it's youtube.com slash WZOUK. I will put it is here as well to the chat. Okay. All our lectures you can find here as well. Yes, Tuvia is not coming back. Let's see maybe something on WhatsApp. No, I think it's something with his connection because he is not answering on WhatsApp as well. My sincere apologies, ladies and gentlemen. And I think I will need to tell you, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, uh, stay tuned for our next lectures. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Stay Thank safe. You very much. And I hope Thank you very you much. From Thank Johannesburg. You. Oh, amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> From Johannesburg. Thank you very much. Been great. Really enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Also. It's really Hi. lovely. Lovely. Lovely having the experience. Very Thank you. That Very interesting and enjoyable. Thank you so much. Enjoy Sunday. Thank you, David Sharon and Irene from Golders Green. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Shalom. Until the next one. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Have a good one. Shabbat shalom. If you yeah, ever shabbat find Tuvia again, tell him we love him. <laughs>